Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 62. We'll talk about managing the pandemic by the numbers, uh, some updates on the vaccines and the race against the new variants. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about it with using uh, this uh, picture I borrowed from your local epidemiologist Facebook page, which, they, which I think again does a great job of summarizing some things. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we are uh, we passed 400,000 fatalities in the U.S. last month, and we're headed toward 500. And most experts say we're going to be over 600,000 unless we just really do everything perfectly, which uh, probably is not going to be the case. Um, the big problem, though, of course, in addition to that, is the new variants, which could make things worse. Uh, I think you might notice, for example, two other countries that have actually done it on a per capita basis worse than us are Brazil and the United Kingdom. It's no accident that's where the variants came from. Uh, when vaccine, when the virus spreads out of control, that's when variants happen. And you can see here United Kingdom having a much worse uh, rates than uh, us here in the United States, unfortunately. Um, so the problem that people need to really understand that every new infection is another roll of the dice for either a new more infectious variant, a more vaccine resistant variant, or a more deadly strain, or any, all of the above potentially. And so we have to slow down spread to slow down mutations and the possibility that a more infectious strain that would exceed our vaccine. Uh, evade our vaccines would happen. And that's something that people keep missing. We're not done just because we got a vaccine. Uh, it's kind of adding to the problems with the great, what I call the Great Barrington debacle I talked about back in October. Uh, this theory put out by some folks who were really sort of amateurish in some ways and didn't really have a good experience, but unfortunately, uh, it's really that took off to a certain people of a certain polit political persuasion, unfortunately. The Great Barrington debacle was wrong for a couple of reasons. One, they had a theory of natural herd immunity that really doesn't stand up to evidence. Uh, two, they had a public health goal. They didn't understand that the goal of public health is not to lock things down. The goal is to avoid lockdowns by doing a better job of controlling things. And by doing then, that get that gets the economy back on track. And they misinterpret what the public health is trying to do. Uh, they also proposed a way that just simply a solution wasn't feasible. You cannot isolate the low risk and high risk populations uh, for any sustained period of time. And that's why everybody who saw this said, no, this is not going to work. It means we're going to have likely deaths in the 500,000 to a million range. This is from back in October. And unfortunately, it looks like we're already headed there and probably at least 600,000 fatalities. But if we get this thing wrong, it could be up in the million dollar range. Um, the other new thing is this one and done assumption that that's, uh, that was wrong, that, that the people who wrote the Great Barrington uh, directive thought that we just get the, once you got the, 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 the infection you'd be done and you go along your merry way but that's not how a lot of viruses work actually uh, so back then the question was you know will the coronavirus be like HIV and herpes with no good vaccine unfortunately despite decades of research or uh, would it be more like influenza where it would mutate and you'd have a new vaccine every year or like tetanus and pertussis where there's some waning immunity and you need a booster periodically every you know five or ten years or something like that they assumed it would be like measles or polio or smallpox where a couple doses of a vaccine or getting it uh, the infection uh, the hard way would make you immune for life but unfortunately that is not how coronavirus is working it's more like two where one you there is, is mutation which we now discover with these new variants and there's also weight weaning immunity so it's not going to work and so their, their theory is wrong for yet one more reason um, and, uh, you know, one thing I, I want to kind of call, I got called out for maybe being a little uh, too blatant about some things. So uh, experts should have at least two of these credentials. Uh, a couple things. One, an MD is equivalent to a DO, so people don't miss that. There's two different training ways to get, become a physician in the United States, and either is act equivalent. I actually don't distinguish the, between the two anymore, but some do. Um, and there are exceptions to this. There are people with an MD only who are certainly good uh experts in this field. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fauci is an obvious uh, uh, exception to the to two, uh, two of the three thing I was proposing and he's he's been he's got more on the job training uh, for more years than I've been alive uh, but it is important that people have those overlapping disciplines to truly understand this the great Barrington folks uh, one two of the guys are PhD only but they're sort of more theoretical epidemiologists that actually don't have a lot of on the world real world practice and the one MD PhD combination guy, his actual background isn't isn't public health. It's it's health. It's medical economics. So it's the wrong field, and it doesn't mean that they can't propose ideas. But it should send up to scrutiny from all these other people who do those, and they and they didn't unfortunately. And so uh, you know thousands and thousands of health public health experts have said the Great Barrington Protocol is wrong. Uh, really, all the public health experts, the key is spread. You got to early identify, treat, uh, isolate, uh, and continue and decrease the amount of spread that's happening. And so most like this COVID act now, we had a sea of red a few weeks ago. We are starting to get to what would might be considered the orange lane level at least. Uh, it's, uh, so in Lancaster County here, for example, we're almost back down to where we were in October. We're down to what might be considered an orange versus red level, and the rest of the state's pretty much the same way. Uh, you really have to get below 2,500,000 to be any even semblance of a control, but you really need to be lower. Um, and it's this 
added control is why our fatalities are leveling off now. Uh, and so the problem that people keep forgetting, at least uh, at least our state, is that it's not hospitalization rate because hospitalization rate will, was predetermined by your infection spread rate. And so you focus on infectious spread because otherwise you're going to end up with mortality before you know it. Uh, so here we are in Lincoln, Lancaster County. Uh, we need to be but down in here to be considered anywhere near safe, and we're not there yet. And uh, the and I, Ireland is a good instructive case. So Ireland, uh, over the Christmas holidays and New Year's, was down in the six per hundred thousand, but people started going out to the bars, family gatherings, and when with the, that with the combination, combination of the new variant, they went from six per hundred thousand to over a hundred and thirty within three weeks. That's how fast these new variants can spread. We're not even down to here yet. We're down to about here. So we, they would it went from there to there in less than two weeks, and we could be the same. So saying that we're quote green and everybody can go to full restaurant capacity is completely wrong. And there's no public health science saying that would be the case unfortunately. As much as we'd like it to be true, it is not true. Um, and, and what we have to do is we have to keep the infection spread down so that we can get vaccinated first. Uh, unfortunately, Nebraska is falling farther and farther behind. We started off with a good uh, start the first couple of weeks. We were in the top five and then dropped to the top 10. Now we're down to 47th out of 59 when you include all the territories. So if you add the states, territories, DC, we're 47th out of 59. So we are falling way behind in our vaccination uh, campaign, unfortunately. Uh, last week I proposed a, m a metric of, of getting the backlog down to less than seven days. We've only made a little bit of progress. We were at 17 day backlog, now we're down to 16. So if you take the, the vaccine sort of on hand waiting to be put in arms versus the daily average of how many we're vaccinating, we got 16 day supply yet. We really need to be getting to the point where when the vaccine comes to Nebraska, it needs to be in an arm within five to seven days. And, and we need to speed this up. It's gonna be really hard to do this if we, if we only pick a mass vaccination approach like at the Pinnacle Bank Arena. You're gonna have to broaden to uh, using the primary care doctor's offices and the pharmacies at some point. Uh, so this uh, way, one analogy I'd use, this is kind of like the snow removal. You know, you use the city to do the arterials, but it's better to use the independent, track, independent contractors to do the side streets. And so we're going to have to move from this, everybody come down to the Pinnacle Bank Arena to uh, at some point start including the primary care doctor's offices, because otherwise you're going to reduce, or you're going to worsen health disparities. There are people who can't get down there, people don't understand the system, uh, the people who enter their information wrong, uh, to prioritize some health conditions, they don't fit in nice needle, needle little categories, and, and frankly just a trust issue. So we're going to have to move from this uh, not just a one-pronged approach of mass vaccinations at the Pinnacle Bank. We're going to start, you need to start using our pharmacies and our primary care offices in the future. Um, there is a concern voiced by some that, that somehow the urban areas were getting shorted vaccine. That is not the case. The vaccine was uh, distributed based on a per capita basis for a population. And what happens is in the urban areas, there is a higher no proportion of healthcare and nursing home folks. Uh, Omaha and Lincoln are regional medical centers, so they've got a lot of doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, uh, and so they have a lot more people in this 1A to vaccinate before they could get to the next 1B level, whereas rural area, there were less of those people to vaccinate so they could get to rural, get to 1B faster because they didn't have such a predominance of healthcare workers in their communities like we do in Omaha and Lincoln. Uh, added to that, the take up by the doctors and nurses was different. Uh, the doctors and nurses in rural areas are a little more resistant themselves sometimes to getting vaccines for some of the same cultural factors for everything else. Uh, so for example, if you look at the influenza vaccination rates across Nebraska, there's a twofold variation between some rural areas and some urban areas and the, and the, and the cultural factors that lead someone in western Nebraska to not want a flu shot are the same things that lead someone to not want a coronavirus shot. So there were less people to work through. So the, the only good news is if you're in a rural area and you're 75, you're probably going to get vaccinated sooner than if you're in an urban area and you're 75 because there's less people in front of you because some people are opting not to get it for whatever reason they have. Uh, another th problem is the ethical dilemma of prioritization. So there's a lot of angst about, well, should we vaccinate elderly first, teachers first, who gets first? Uh, the problem is this is not this is not an easy uh, decision. It's not black and white. Uh, you have to balance the risk of, uh, of dying if you have COVID, but plus your risk of contracting uh, uh, coronavirus. And everybody that will have a different risk if they get it. So an 82-year-old retiree would have a 1 in 13 chance of dying based on our current Nebraska case fatality rates, whereas the 70 and 68-year-old would be 1 in 41. The 51-year-old world would only be 1 in 349. However, the risk of actually contracting coronavirus might be higher in the teacher because they're around say 100 students a day in school or an accountant who's seeing people for their tax planning for example every day every day whereas the professor who might be teaching remotely or their retiree could stay at home and avoid contact uh, so who deserves to get it first well it's sort of a weighing decision it's not black or white uh, these are the numbers from this morning basically based on hospitalization fatality rates sometimes it's easier to look at it graphed 
Uh, and here's what it looks like in a graphical format. So your risk of dying should you get coronavirus uh, goes up dramatically once you start crossing 55 and really goes up here. So should we focus here because of that higher risk, even though the risk of contracting is lower or someone who's exposed a lot but has extremely low risk, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a, a black or white decision. And I, I can make arguments for both sides. Uh, you know, I did forward uh, on Facebook this Axios article, which is kind of trilling, uh, uh, chilling. The, the, there is a chance we could have a longer, deadlier pandemic if some things go wrong, if we lose this race of vaccination versus spread of, of uh, coronavirus, and we really need to be doing both. Uh, Michael Osterholm talked a little bit about it on his last week's Thursday update. Highly encourage you to listen to it. Uh, his theme was surrender is not an option. We can't give up. We have to keep focusing on limiting spread. And, and some people seem to be giving up on that still, including our state, unfortunately, in some areas. Uh, we do need to still have mask ordinances. We do need to slow spread so that we do not get more variants. The next variant may not may be in, come from Kansas. It might come from Canada. It might come from Cass County. Every new uh, spread could be a chance for a new variant. Uh, and so this is where it's going to make the uh, vaccination more complicated. You know, the good news is that the, the Johnson and Johnson and the Novavax vaccines are effective, not quite as good as Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, Johnson and Johnson might be easier to get because it's one shot, doesn't need to be frozen, but it's not as good as the others. And it's also maybe not as good against the new variants, unfortunately. And so we really need to slow down uh, spread so we don't get uh, a lot of these variants spreading around so that we can get things that are controlled with the vaccine first. So we're sort of in a race against time at this point. Uh, another thing to look at is the risk comparison of, of the serious adverse reactions. There are common reactions. A lot of people, a second shot may get some achiness and chills and tiredness for 24 hours, but serious reactions are actually extremely rare. Uh, so they've, uh, the Pfizer Moderna vaccines have been getting to, you know, pretty much tens of millions of people here at this point. That chance of having a serious reaction is extremely low compared to coronavirus deaths so far. And this is going to keep going up, by the way. Uh, in the middle here is your chance of dying in a car wreck each year. So you should worry more about dying in a car wreck than you should about having an adverse reaction to a Moderna or a Pfizer vaccine. And, and again, they're going to protect you against this. And this isn't death. This is just an adverse reaction, whereas these are death. So uh, way worse, of course. Um, uh, it's also, you know, the data behind this is just going to get more and more solid. And again, your local epidemiologist, uh, her Facebook page, she's doing a great job of just posting all the numbers out there. Uh, and we have millions and millions of, of, ca of, of cases to study as far as age of vaccination, uh, 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 yeah, ethnicities, gender. Uh, we're now getting pregnant women so that we can figure out for sure is it safe when you're breastfeeding or pregnant. Uh, most uh, doctors are saying that the vaccine is safe uh, in, with uh, breastfeeding. Uh, pregnancy, I think, is a little more complicated, and you really try to discuss that with your physician. Although I think the risk of, of coronavirus while pregnant is is higher than any potential risk of of the, of the vaccine, actually. But still, this is a harder discussion that you should really have with your physician if you're pregnant. Uh, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about schools. So, uh, you know, I think schools are, can be done safely, and I think we've got pretty good evidence that we are doing it here safely in Lincoln. However, we need a better way to monitor, especially if these new variants come in. Uh, the good news is we do are going to have uh, this next week uh, testing in Lincoln Public Schools and quite a few other schools in Nebraska. We need to test, we need an additional way to monitor safety rather than just uh, contact tracing. That's slow and complete. Um, it's going to take two to three weeks to know if a variant gets in your community if you're just doing contact tracing, whereas uh, on-site testing will be a much better way to test this. Uh, this isn't just me saying this. Dr. Fauci in, in this uh, Ed Week article, uh, that's one of the things he talked about is the need for doing some some testing with uh, for in the schools to, to monitor to make sure things are safe too. Uh, also, it's in the Biden uh, national plan that we should be, uh, be having testing uh, in in schools and a screening to, to start to help uh, keep sa uh, schools safely opened. Uh, and so we do need some testing. And to me, this has been one of my frustration. I've been pushing this, some of you know, for months. Uh, you know, for me, my very first day of public health practice at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, more than a decade ago, uh, slide number six, the core function of a public health department is assessment, policy development, and assurance. That's what this should be. So policy development is the health department's work with schools to develop an evidence-based way to keep our kids safe in a, in a pandemic. It's their duty then to assess that policy to make sure it's working. Uh, and so this assessment assurance is, is it is their duty to do it. So not doing the above is public health malpractice in my opinion. We need a monitoring system, including testing in our schools going forward if we wanna make sure this is safe as possible to get as many kids back in school as possible. 
so lastly, of course, you know, we, we need to keep Nebraska deaths. Uh, we, I was hoping we'd keep them below 2,000. It doesn't look like we're going to do that, but I think we should. There's no excuse we couldn't keep them below 3,000. Uh, and it's really, it's the basic control measures. We need mask ordinances. People need to wear masks. They, they were more likely to wear them when there is a mask ordinance. That's why they work. Uh, we need to avoid the crowded spaces, keeping your distance, and get vaccinated when your number is finally called. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, again, this is what I do for a living, but disclaimer, this is uh, my opinion, not necessarily all of the folks I work with and for.